Hello, everybody on Zoom. Can you hear me? Excellent. That was my problem with the other laptop. Nobody could hear me. All right, so we can move to your gallery. All right, I've got another one coming in. Input, yes, that is working. Excellent. Okay, next. I need to get our video ready. All right. Oh, brother, come on. Reload, reload. So everybody at home can hear me, yeah? Somebody say yes, because I'm actually looking at something else, not watching you nodding. Yes. Excellent. Thank you for that. Yes. Okay, back to the search. Okay. Here we are. Okay. I do sincerely apologize for being so late in getting us started. I forgot. So the last two sessions that we've been doing this with my Frankenstein Zoom uh Zoom and in-person setup here. I have been using my, uh, my MacBook Air and uh, this morning I forgot to bring it because it's not my standard work computer. I use a, a Windows machine for work in general and, uh, and I thought, not gonna make a big difference, right? Yeah, it made a big difference because the, the one cable, there's the, I have this one cable here that plugs into the laptop that goes to the microphone over there so that the folks at home can actually hear me properly without a whole lot of crazy echo, right? See, that just feeds the, that way the microphone sits just in front of the speaker so that when I speak through the speaker, the, it, sends the, it sends the sound right into the laptop so they can hear me without a lot of craziness. Yeah, this cable didn't work with my PC. So I had to run home and get my MacBook. So thank you all for your patience. Thank you all for your patience at home waiting for me to start up the, uh, the Zoom late. I appreciate it. Uh, since this is our third time, I will keep the announcements to a minimum and we can dive right into the search. I do have one quick announcement. Um, before we begin, I would like to introduce Isabel Vallis. Isabel, who is here in person, and I'll just uh, turn this around. There she is. Isabel is, uh, is a confirmation catechist colleague of mine who has been, uh, who's been my right hand in confirmation for some years. Um, she is, she's back in the process now. She'll be joining us here in person. And the reason I wanted to introduce her is so that A, you'll probably hear her during the conversation time, and B, the next thing that we are doing, now that we've gotten most people's paperwork turned in and we're got going on the search here so that that's kind of familiar and we know how to do that. The next element to confirmation preparation that I would like to add is to, is to uh, begin a series of confirmation interviews or maybe a better, better language would be a confirmation conversations in which either myself or Isabel will have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with each candidate for confirmation. That way we get to begin to get to know you individually, not just through the summaries that you write, but also through direct conversation, which we haven't had a chance to do given the format challenges of this year so far. That's probably going to start either late March or early April. Izzy and I are just going to uh, put the finishing touches on organizing the logistics of that, and it will be either through teleconference, we can, uh, we can Zoom, we can do other kinds of teleconferencing, or it will be uh, in person with masks and physical distance, uh, either here at the church, well, here at the church, uh, probably in a meeting room across the parking lot. So that's coming, that's like a coming attraction, 
and, and I thank Izzy for, for joining me again in the process and for being here today. With that in mind, then let's jump right into the search episode three. Why a God? That is, if I can find the proper screen, I think, is it this one? No, it's not that one. Where is it? Where is it? I had it. You guys saw me have it. That. I'm going to cancel that. Come down here. Ah, it was minimized. That's why I couldn't share to it. I bet. I bet. Yep, there it is. There we go. Here we go. looking for something. The story of human history has largely been a story of faith. We need our relationship with our maker, our relationship with life to make sense. Where did this all come from? What on earth am I here for? Where am I going? What happens when I die? We want answers to our fundamental questions about the meaning of life. Throughout history and all around the world, we human beings have sought to make sense of all of this. You go to the most distant, untouched jungles and you will find that people are ritualizing things to give expression to what they believe. You can go to Israel and the center of worship for the Jews for centuries was their temple. And in the center of that temple was an altar. Or you can go to any Catholic church in the world and see an altar. You can go to Greece and Rome and they had altars where they offered sacrifice to their gods. You go all the way to the other side of the planet in Hawaii, you find what's called a heiau, that's the Hawaiian word for temple. And you find ahus, that's the Hawaiian word for altar. There's altars in these different cultures that never had any physical contact with each other at all. And not only did they give outward expression to the things they believed, they did it in the same way. They sought, where did all this come from? And how do I honor the source of all this by offering something in return? There's something we need about this whole exchange with the divine to give us a sense of purpose and meaning about the idea that we're not a cosmic accident. This world makes sense. There is an unseen reality interacting with us and guiding us through life. There's an end purpose to all of this. But the big question is, but is this all true? Is this whole religion thing just kind of a big waste of time? I mean, is there even a God? Despite the fact that human beings have been religious throughout history, there's this growing notion today that God's no longer necessary. In fact, faith is a little bit silly, a thing of the past. One of the deepest questions we can be asked or we can ask ourselves is, is it reasonable to believe in God? There was a famous atheist Russian cosmonaut who got in outer space and he looked around and he said, there's no God anywhere. You know, modern atheists mock our idea of God and saying, yeah, yeah, whatever. I believe in a flying spaghetti monster. No self-respecting Christian <laughs> believes that God is this mythological creature flying around in space. That's just not what we mean when we say the word God. I think that sometimes people reject God because they have a false understanding of who God is. Even religious people, in the back of their mind somewhere, they think of God as this old man in the sky, like that guy in the pink bedsheet on the roof of the Sistine Chapel. 
Or on the other extreme, people kind of have this idea of God as a nebulous force, but isn't really personal or specific. So then who is this God that we're looking for? We don't think that God's this mythological creature flying around in space. You see, we believe that God is existence itself, that space and time are flying around in him. The fact that anything exists causes us to accept and embrace a mystery at the heart of reality. The fact that all of human experience suggests that it is reasonable to believe in God. And indeed, those who came long before Christianity, such as the Greek philosophers, came to an understanding just through the use of reason alone that God must exist. Throughout all of history, people have looked outside of themselves to find the answers to their fundamental questions. And of course, for Christians, it's only natural that the cosmos that's made by that God should, if you like, be smudged with his fingerprints. Yeah, I think we're the first era in history to have so many people say, God, if you're really there, why don't you reveal yourself to us? I think God is looking down from heaven saying, did you not notice everything? As St. Augustine said, Question the beauty of the earth. Question the beauty of the sea. Question the beauty of the air. Question the beauty of the sky. Question the serried ranks of the stars. Question the sun making the day glorious with its bright beams. Question the moon tempering the darkness of the following night with its shining rays. Question the animals that move in the waters that amble about on dry land, that fly in the air, their souls hidden, their bodies evident. Question all these things, they all answer you. Here we are, look, we're beautiful. Their beauty is their confession. Who made these beautiful, changeable things, if not one who is beautiful and unchangeable? All creation shouts to us about the existence of God. And not just the existence of this force that's removed from us, but a God who's beautiful and who loves us. You know, if you go to a museum and stare at a painting, get lost in it, you don't just see the painting. You get an insight into the heart of a painter. I think most of us want to believe in God. We want there to be more to life. We want there to be a meaning to it all. We want there to be an afterlife. You know, we have this built into us that we want answers to those fundamental questions, but more and more people are holding back from that hope. They stopped asking those questions because you know, maybe they think faith is foolish. People tend to view Christians today more and more as an anti-science, anti-intellectual group of people. What a myth that is. Welcome to the middle of nowhere. Here in the remote and beautiful mountains of the Arizona desert, you'll find something unexpected A modern observatory, fully equipped to explore the universe, run and owned by none other than the Roman Catholic Church. So the Vatican has its own astronomical observatory up on Mount Graham. This seems to surprise a lot of people. Often when people come to visit, the first thing they ask is, why on earth does the Vatican have an observatory? My somewhat mischievous reply is that it's because we can't afford a particle accelerator. So the Vatican Observatory was founded in the 1580s by Pope Gregory the 13th in the context of his reform of the calendar. The old Julian calendar was messing up. Uh, it didn't have the length of the year right. It was in the Tower of the Winds in Vatican City. It also had telescopes at the Campidoglio in Rome. And it also had telescopes at the Jesuits Roman College. 
There were four telescope domes on the walls of Vatican City. The entire Vatican was basically an astronomical observatory. The Vatican Observatory moved to Castel Gandolfo in 1935, and right away, two telescopes were installed on top of the Pope's summer vacation home. These telescopes were the cutting edge of 1935 technology. The Jesuits of the Vatican Observatory have been side by side with the Pope's, sharing views to the telescope. But by the 1970s, 1980s, the lights of Rome were encroaching to the point where it was difficult to do successful observations for research purposes from that location. So we were chased out of Rome by light pollution. Tucson, Arizona is one of the major centers for astronomy. And it is really a place where quite a lot of things happen when it comes to the development of astronomical instrumentation. So it is a good place to be. The Vatican Observatory came to have its own telescope at Tucson, and it's up on Mount Graham. The reason for being of the observatory is the mere fact of having competent, hardworking, regular scientists who happen also to be priests and brothers living in community and doing science on behalf of the church. It is the church's participative calling card in the world of astronomy. Some of them focus on galaxies and the evolution of galaxies. Some focus on stars, the life cycle of stars. Some focus on planets of our solar system or exoplanets. Some focus on near-Earth objects and asteroids. Quite apart from there being any sort of conflict of science and faith, the long-standing complementarity, love, collaboration between the church and science. Remember, if you're doing science, you're doing it for real, you are looking for the truth. <laughs> and the church is all about the truth. If faith were anti-science, someone should tell George Lemaitre, who came up with what's now called the Big Bang Theory, or Roger Bacon, who's the grandfather of the scientific method. They were both Catholic priests. If faith is anti-science and anti-reason, someone desperately needs to tell Nicholas Copernicus, pioneer of heliocentrism, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, who prefigured the theory of evolution with Lamarckism, with Friar Gregor Mendel, the pioneer of genetics, or Father Angelo Secchi, father of stellar spectroscopy. All those people were priests and religious. There are even 35 Jesuits on the moon, 35 lunar features named after priests because they discovered them. The church is hardly opposed to science. Science can sometimes appear like it's just a mere body of information. What I think is really beautiful about science, though, is that it's, it's more interactive. It's a tool that we can use to investigate and understand the world around us. They're separate things. They're answering separate questions. Why am I here? Why do I exist? You know, why is the universe here? Those sort of questions, science doesn't necessarily attack. Science can tell us the how of things, how the universe works, but it can't address certain questions like the why of the universe. You know, why was it created? Why are we here? Faith isn't anti-science. Faith gave birth to the sciences because it gave people a worldview that said, this world we find ourselves in inherently makes sense. It has order to it. And why? because it was birthed from an ordered mathematical mind that makes sense. So let's dive in and dissect it. The questions that really make me excited uh, within astronomy is thinking about our own origins. My name is Karen Oberg. I am a professor of astronomy at Harvard University. I am also an adult convert to Catholicism. So what I do here at Harvard is that I'm combining my expertise in chemistry and in astronomy to try to figure out how our solar system formed, how our Earth became the, the habitable, the living planet it is, and then how other planets form and the likelihood of finding other living planets out there. I actually find modern cos cosmology and is probably telling us something about the personality of the creator. I mean, this seems to be a god who 
wants the universe to participate in creating, uh, where we see the how the universe changes over time and new structures, often unexpected structures, appears, but still in accordance with the laws of nature. Uh, I think that the word exists at all points to that there is a creator who created the word. Uh, I think the beauty of the cosmos points towards a creator that is beautiful and that values uh, beauty. The intelligibility of the word points to an intelligent creator. You know, you can't even do science unless you start with the presupposition, with the faith, if you will, that the world itself is stable and reasonable and orderly. Science can't prove that the world is gonna be the way tomorrow that it is today. Science can't prove that we can make sense of reality. Science has to presuppose that. In the Christian view, at least, the ground of the order and intelligibility of the world is God. So that's the answer to the limit question, if you will. Why is there something rather than nothing? And why is that something orderly rather than chaotic? Science does a great job of unpacking and exploring that order. But science can't explain why science can do that. You know, the more we learn about the universe, the more it shouts to us about the existence of God. If you see a bunch of dominoes tumbling over, you know it had to start somewhere. You know, our belief in God starts at the beginning. But let me take you back. Let's go back before the start of recorded history. Let's go even further back, 4.6 billion years ago, to when the sun was created. Actually, let's go even further back. Okay, keep going, keep going, 13.7 billion years. And that brings us here, where there's nothing. I don't just mean no stars. I mean no time, no space, nothing. Everything is an effect of some cause. As a matter of fact, the whole of the universe is simply a series of cause and effect relationships. Our parents are the cause of ourselves, for example. But that's true in everything in material experience. But we ought to know that the universe itself is a giant effect. It is itself something which has been caused. What cause would be sufficient to cause all other causes and effects? That cause, which is superior to all causes, and so also all effects, is what we call God. The question that often comes up is, which is true, the Big Bang or biblical creation? You have one origin story in the Bible. It's actually spelled out very clearly, like Genesis seems to have a very clear story to it. And then you have a separate origin story uh, using the scientific method that is telling us that things happen gradually over incredible long periods of time. So you seem to have two accounts. They're saying different things. Uh, they can't both be true, can they? For me, it's not an either or. The Big Bang, is a scientific theory which tells a causal story about how the universe moved from an earlier state to a later state. That's what science does. That's not what Christian creation is trying to do. The Christian creation story is about how reality itself came to be, how the causal laws came to be. What is very important then is to look at Genesis and try to understand what is the main point of Genesis and what is using the cosmology of the time. What is special is how that cosmology is interpreted and especially how everything um, comes from one God is a loving act of creation uh, that is happening in an orderly uh, way, in an intelligible uh, way, uh, and how humans are created in a special way uh, within, within that order.
I think we want to make sure we approach the Bible or really any piece of literature by asking what the author intend to communicate, not approaching the scriptures like a fundamentalist, just reading it at face value, reading in a very wooden way, but really thinking through what is the author trying to communicate, understanding its original historical context, understanding the literary genres and the modes of expression that are being used. That's just good reading of any kind of literature. We need to look at the Bible the same way. The creation story is about why there's something rather than nothing and about why the something that exists has the kind of order which makes science possible. Once that all exists, scientists can investigate away and come up with a big bang theory. Amen. That's searching for the truth. And that's searching for God. That's pointing to God. But it's different from the biblical story of creation, which is pointing to God who creates something out of nothing and who gives order to that something. When I read Genesis, I have that now modern cosmology in the back of my mind. I see harmony and I think that the way I read Genesis has become more beautiful the more I learn about uh, our cosmology, our origins, and not less so. Faith and reason are like two wings on which the human spirit rises to the contemplation of truth. And God has placed in the human heart a desire to know the truth. In a word, to know himself. Pope John Paul II said that. No, it's not science against religion. <laughs> it's this very weak philosophy called scientism against religion. This idea that you can only arrive at truth by studying things using the scientific method and whatever fits into that little tiny category is true and the rest, eh, you can't really know. So you can't know anything about friendship, about love, about the fact that a sunset is beautiful. Those things can't be verified using the scientific method. You can't know anything about a poem or about literature being good or bad. Hmm? No, faith opens up your heart and mind to the full big picture of reality. That's where faith comes in. Strictly speaking, what we call faith is something that all human beings exercise. Um, we have to have faith just to interact with other human beings. We have to have trust in the actions of others. If we're studying science, we need to have faith that the scientists have run the experiments that are being described in the textbook, right? Which demonstrate certain scientific truths, right? It requires faith in the conduct of other human beings. St. Augustine actually says that you can't live a human life without faith of this natural kind. So it's not as though that faith is peculiar to Christians. All human beings exercise a kind of faith, belief in other human beings, belief that certain things they're taught are true. But faith in the religious sense, in the Christian sense, really has to do with a real form of knowing which extends to things which are beyond the normal mode of knowing. So things that can be learned through sense experience. And faith is really this capacity to recognize the truth of things that we couldn't know naturally through the normal human means. It's not that what we believe in is unreasonable. It's that what we believe in is something that is beyond our ability to reason. <laughs> you can't fully fit it in your head. It's like trying to bite a wall. And that's what we actually call faith in the religious or spiritual sense. It's a spiritual capacity to say yes to something which the intellect cannot directly see on its own. Not because it's not true, but because it can't be sensed, it can't be acquired or come to be known through the normal mode of sense experience. The problem for most of us isn't a complete lack of faith in God, a complete rejection of the idea that there's anything beyond the creative world. Most of us do have an intuition that there's something more to life, there's something more than just what I can see and touch and hear and feel and all those things. But the problem is, is that we tend to be a little bit lazy. We tend not to really want to think about who God is and really pursue him. Maybe we think it doesn't matter. Maybe we think God is just sort of a nebulous force and he's happy as long as we're happy. Or maybe we think of God as a kind of therapist who's just there when I need his help. And then otherwise he's just doing his own thing in heaven. If God is really out there, if God is really personal in some sense, and he's trying to communicate with us, trying to talk to us, 
and also if God is who he says he is, infinite, eternal, and all of those things, then God really is worth getting to know. So then who is this God that we're looking for? If we've rejected the notion that God is just an old dude in the sky, that he's some kind of magical person floating up in the clouds, if we reject that idea, we're confronted with the true God. And the true God is not a human being times a million. The divine nature is not human nature, just amplified. The true God is all powerful, which isn't really, really, really powerful. The true God is all knowing. That doesn't just mean knowing lots and lots and lots. And this God is worth searching for. This God is worth knowing. This God can be a little terrifying. It's a little scary to start pursuing someone who isn't old, who doesn't even exist in time, who isn't big because he transcends space and created space. That's the kind of God that we're searching for. That's the kind of God that we want to know more about because that's actually a confrontation with the meaning of life and the meaning of who we are and the meaning of the universe. So faith is a choice. It's a reasonable choice. But let me go a step further here. If you want a meaningful life, if you want joy and peace and happiness and a sense of purpose, it's also a necessary choice. I mean, a lot of people think that religion is totally irrelevant, that we don't even need to ask these fundamental questions about the meaning of life or about God to live with any sense of purpose or peace or happiness. Think about this. I mean, if there's nothing outside of us that created us or nothing toward which we are ordered as human beings, then when it comes to questions of good or bad or right or wrong or evil, it's just a matter of opinions. Let's go a step further. Can we even talk about good and evil, right or wrong, if there's no maker? What is goodness? What is moral goodness if there's no maker? You know, something is good for something else if it helps it fulfill its purpose. Gasoline is good for your car because your car has a created purpose. The only reason there is good and bad at the end of the day is because we have a created purpose, because we have a creator. So listen, if you don't have faith, I wanna leave you with this challenge. Ask God to show you. Ask him to show you if he exists or not. If you have just a little tiny flicker of faith, but want a lot more, ask him to give you more. You have absolutely nothing to lose and potentially everything to gain. So all our searching as a human race ultimately leads us back to our source, to the big God question. Look, if you want real meaning, real purpose, a, a firm sense of happiness, you know, faith, you can't just see it as something reasonable. It's essential because only that fundamental belief that your existence in the cosmos is not the result of a cosmic accident, only that belief that you're more than a random collection of molecules destined for nothingness, only that belief that there's something more waiting for you after your death, only that can, can give you a sense of purpose that you need to have the happiness that you've always been looking for. You know, a lot of people don't even get to the table where they're coming together and asking these questions because we've gotten so dang good at living constantly distracted lives. We're so good at forgetting our fundamental longing today. The search at the end of the day is the search for meaning, for happiness, the search for God. Because if there's no God, life's a cosmic accident, that's it. If there's no author, there's no story. You're part of a big show about nothing. We're made by God and for God. We're supposed to look for him to be the fulfillment of the deepest longings in our souls. And what if that God that you've always really been looking for, even if you've not named him, that God that the human race has always been looking for through all our religious beliefs and practices throughout history, what if that God what if he came looking for you? Ooh, spoiler alert. That's what the next episode's gonna be about. Okay. All right. 
All right, all right, all right. So before we get into pair conversation and doing your turn-ins, um, I just wanna say one quick word about attendance so as to be clear. For those of you who are at home on Zoom, I'm gonna remind you that if you're on Zoom, you also need to be on this web page here. Come to CF Gatherings on strcc.org slash CF Gatherings so that you can click this link right here called Digital Turnit. When you click that link, it opens up a Google form called Online Turnin for Search Session 3 for February 21st. You need to fill in these and then click Submit. Clicking Submit on this form is what I use to determine your participation. Logging into the Zoom and participating in the Zoom by itself does not constitute participation. I, I don't have a log of who's on the Zoom and I, and I don't have an easy way to write down who was in the Zoom and not everybody, we don't have time for everybody to say something on the Zoom. So this is my way of keeping track of who's doing what, all right? For those of you who come in person, if you miss one of these in-person sessions, you can always watch the video afterwards and then do the digital turn-in and then you get to make up the one of the byproducts of this weird year with this online version is that you actually can make up sessions that you miss, all right? So for those of you who maybe have come to all the Zooms but weren't turning in those digital turn-ins, please make sure that you do that, all right? Second, before we go to our pair conversation, does anybody have any questions that they wanna ask about that video? Anything that I could clarify? before we move into our pair conversations. Any immediate reactions or responses that you wanna share? Feel free to unmute and just jump in, my Zoomers. Nada, nothing. All right, then pair conversation it is. Uh, we'll give, due to the time, we'll give about 10 minutes. Go to pair conversation. That means with your companion, either ideally your sponsor or with a parent or with some other adult or older person with whom you can have good conversation. I encourage you to look at, for those of you here in person, uh, we have the turn-ins on paper. That looks like this. Um, so I encourage all of you to read all of the quotes first. See what catches your fancy. Right. See what what uh, what what most interests you to discuss. Then discuss a few, and then uh, and then after your conversation, just jot down some notes. Share with me some of what you talked about. Doesn't have to be a transcription. Doesn't have to be complete. I just want to know kind of where the conversation led. What what you were talking about. All right. And do please fill out the last one, the wrap up. Uh, I do ask you to do that one. The very same goes for all of you on Zoom. Uh, if you're not in the same room as your companion, then you could always just jump on the phone, have a talk, uh, cross multiple Zoom windows, whatever you're doing, uh, but have those conversations, fill in those digital Zooms on Google, and then click submit, and we'll be back for some large group discussion and finish up uh, in about 10 minutes.
All right, everybody, my least favorite task is to interrupt good conversation, but it is a must so that we can finish up with some uh, larger group conversation. So which, uh, which quotation caught your interest the most? Which one was most interesting to you? Which one did you spend the most time talking about? Which one, Christian? Mm -hmm. You know what, I forgot again that without the microphone, the Zoomers can't hear you. So I'm gonna ask you to once, just once repeat yourself. Before, uh, the truth about that the church really wants the truth and that's true now, but in the past, the church was not like that. The church was totally against any kind of difference. Oh, the world is not flat. Which kill him? Oh, you know math? Kill that person. So like I said, now it's true. Yeah, I guess, you know, they do coincide. But in the past, it was not like that. Well, I think, I think that's, a, that's an excellent point to bring up, not just about the past, but about the present too. Because if we think about Christianity as a broad family of religions, and not just Catholicism, and even within Catholicism, there are those who are uncomfortable with a, 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 an evolution of understanding, with a changing of the way we, we understand things. And you're exactly right. It's that, it's that, that pull, the push and pull between uh, the, that which is comfortable and familiar and that which is, which is new and different. You know, and I think that's, that's just as true today as it is because the, the church is a human institution. And as humans, we're imperfect. We, we, we get scared. We, we don't want to change. We don't want to grow. We don't want to learn sometimes because it's just easier and more comfortable to stay with what, what we know. But I do, but I think that when that Jesuit priest who the quote was that, you know, science is, in, is searching for the truth and the church is in the truth business. I think that's the ideal. The ideal is that we do want to be open to all truth. We want to learn what is true and what is right. Okay, let's see. There's some confusion in the chat room, it looks like. So in the turn-ins, whether the paper version, which there's a handout linked to on the webpage, or in the digital version in the Google form, the, the, what, what the turn-ins have been are selected quotations from the video. So for instance, I'll share, I'll share the Google form. Where's my cursor? There's my cursor. So here's the Google form. You can see. First, read all the quotes below, then discuss your reactions after discussing, share some thoughts. So discussion quote one, discussion quote two, discussion quote three, discussion quote four, and then a wrap up one last question. So the idea is that you read these quotations from the video and then with your partner, then you share discussion about these quotes. You respond. You, you, uh, you know, um, you, you react, you decide, do I agree with this? Do I not agree with this? Does this make sense? Does that make sense? What, what, what does it trip off in you? You know, for, for, for Christian over there, it was, uh, it was the quotation about truth led to a reflection on the idea that, you know, yeah, the church says it's in the truth business, but do we live up to that? And maybe not all the time. So that's a great response. Uh, Maria, in, in answer to your question, no, you don't have to respond to all the quotes. You'll notice that in the Google form, the little red asterisk refers to what is required. I do ask everybody to fill in the last question. What's one takeaway from the session? Otherwise, you get to decide. Names are required. Please put your names on the forms, people. <laughs> Please, you guys, remember to write the names on the forms, people. Uh, but other than that, no, not every quote must be responded to. That's I say, read them all, see what you respond to, what kicks off conversation, and then have some good conversation. Tyler, the link can be found off of our website. So if you go to strcc.org slash cfgatherings, 
standrewrcc.org slash cfgatherings, and then you click on digital turn in under today's date. Today is Sunday the 21st, you click on digital turn in. That's where you get it. Then at the bottom of that form is the submit. That's how you get credit for being here. So if you've been here for previous Zooms and you did not do that, you need to go back and do them. They're all still there. If you just scroll down beneath the 21st, here's the 7th, here's the 17th, okay? They're all there for you to turn in uh, your forms. Likewise, for anybody here who missed an in-person session. All right, so other quotes or other responses to the video. Anybody on Zoom want to uh, jump in and share a piece of their conversation? What did you guys talk about at home? Somebody unmute and share with us what you discussed. How about Grace? Did you, were, were you able to have a conversation? What did you guys talk about most? Just me and my mom talked about a third quote and how science can't answer how of like the how questions of the universe, but God can't answer the why questions. I think I think you meant to say science can answer the how questions, but not the why questions. Is that what you meant? Very good, yeah, that's a very important distinction. Let me ask you, I'm curious about, from all of you, the group, did anybody talk about the, the biblical stuff, about Genesis? Anybody talk about that? Did you find that interesting? What did you guys, uh, what did you guys talk about? Now, let me bring you the mic. we thought it was really interesting how you know in school they teach you about evolution and the big bang theory and versus what's in genesis i think kids are made to feel like you have to believe one or the other so okay wait this makes sense this is what they're teaching us in school but so it was interesting that that theory actually came from a priest or somebody Absolutely. Thank you for bringing that up. Yes, that's why I brought it up, too, is because many of us never get beyond a grade school understanding of how to understand or interpret the Bible. You know, for most of us, the Bible is just presented as if it were just absolute truth. And it is absolute truth. But what it is not is totally fact. There is a distinction between truth and fact. Science deals in fact. And when you walk into a library and you go to the nonfiction section and you pull a science textbook off the shelf, when you start reading that book, you expect it to be factual. But when you go to the, to the, to the literature section of the library and you pull a book off the shelf that is about folklore or that is about uh, fairy tale or that is about parable, you don't read that the same way you read a science textbook, do you? No, you read that and you look for symbolism. You look at the message underneath the story. You look for the, the, the truth that is communicated artistically. And that's why in the video, it spoke about the importance of understanding the intention of the author so that, uh, so that we can best understand how to relate to the literature of the Bible, because the Bible itself is a library. That's why we talk about the book of Genesis, the book of Exodus, the book of the prophet Isaiah, the book of Kings, the book of etc. It's a library, and like any library, it has many different genres, many different modes of expression. There are, there's a song book, there is poetry, there are letters, letter writing in the gospel, I mean in the Bible. And understanding the different genres helps us to understand how to 
how to extract the truth without getting too bogged down about, is it super factual? Because you will find fundamentalist Christians who tie themselves up into knots and pretzel themselves trying to figure out how to make all the facts line up when from our perspective that misses the point. Does that make sense? Any other questions about that before we move on? I'm getting a request in the Zoom to type in the URL for the... There you go. All right. What else? What else did you talk about? What caught your interest? What was, what was interesting to you? What'd you chat? And have been active in the church all of these years. And I was astounded by the church's early sciences in astrology there's where I want to say astronomy okay yes I'm sorry yes 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 astronomy I'm astounded by that the study of the Well, does anybody else want to take that question? The question was, um, young lady over here, was astonished by the idea of the Jesuits of, of the church uh, being so interested in astronomy, having these telescopes. And the question was, why? Why so much energy into astronomy, into telescopes, into, uh, into studying the cosmos? Can anybody, anybody else want to take that? This is not all my show. the connection between astronomy and the foundation of science, because science did, uh, in many ways, the foundations of science are about looking up into the heavens. I mean, notice we call the heaven, that we call the sky the heavens, right? Absolutely, Izzy. I, I find it interesting as well, as you read about the church, the church has always been the champion of education, always from the beginning. Uh, whether it was through art, because people didn't read, they couldn't read, or it was through um, writing books that people could understand. Till today, Bibles, for example, there are some great commentaries in your Bibles that correspond to what you're reading. <clears throat> so the church is still developing more and more understanding from pictures to explanations and, and science because it was, it's always been a part of the education. Yeah, I think it was in either episode two or one, one of the previous search videos that it refers to the fact that the modern university system was basically developed by the Catholic Church. You know, seeking truth means seeking knowledge, both through faith and through reason, and reason leads to, to science, because the more carefully we observe something. Any other questions or responses before we, uh, before we wrap this up? Anybody else want to share anything else? I, oh, I just wanted to respond to the false dichotomy. Those who tell you you can't believe in science and religion don't understand religion. And some of them don't really understand science all that well, because, because you know, those who are really get into science understand that scientists tend to be the ones who are the most humble about what they don't know, right? Christian? Yeah.
Yeah. Yeah, well, and that gets to, so Christian was, for those on Zoom, Christian was talking about how, you know, it's important to remember that a second for God is very different than a second for us. And I think that gets at uh, another understanding of Genesis, too, in terms of Genesis refers to the seven days of creation. When Genesis, when the authors of Genesis were writing about the seven days, did they mean seven rotations of the earth around the sun for a certain number of seconds? No. They were referring to an ordered amount of time uh, that things unfolded in an orderly fashion at the, at the cause, at being caused by God, at the impulse of God, by the will of God. That's what those seven days refer to. And in the Bible, it, it, there's a quote that says, you know, the, what's the quote about time that, that Christian was basically referencing was, you know, a second, uh, a second, a uh, our life is like the blink of an eye to God. I think something like that in, in scripture. But even a more modern or, or a more precise understanding of God is that God doesn't experience seconds at all. God doesn't have his own kind of seconds because he is outside of seconds. He is outside of time. He is eternal. He always was, always will be, right? I love the flip that the video does of is God some giant spaghetti monster <laughs> flying around space, you know, something up there? No, God is not something just bigger than us flying around in space. God is existence. God, all of the universe, all of matter, all of time and space are within God, not the other way around. God is not within time and space somewhere to be pointed to. We are all within the existence of God, eternal and beyond. All right, let us conclude our time together, unless anybody else says anything else. Final call. Final call on Zoom. Anybody want to unmute and share anything? Did I cause any questions or controversy? <laughs> All right, then let's conclude our time together with a little bit of prayer. A little bit of prayer, since I didn't do that in the beginning since I was uh, running around like a crazy man. So let's end our time together in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Lord Jesus, we thank you for the opportunity to come together and to ask big questions, to think big thoughts, to take time out of our busy, productivity-obsessed lives and to pause and ponder the universe and big ideas within it. We thank you for providing us with the, the intellect and the reason and the communication skills to have deep conversation. We ask you to continue to open our hearts, to continue to ever learn more, to seek the truth that ultimately is you. Let us now pause for just a few moments of silence and be within the presence of existence, within the presence of love, within the presence of God. Let's conclude our time together by asking the mother of God for her prayers for us as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you all so much for being here. If you have any questions, I will remain after uh, for a while and answer questions. Um, please do, all of my folks on Zoom, go to that link, go to the web page, open the digital Zoom, the digital turn-ins, those Google Forms, fill them out, click Submit. That's how you get credit.
because I am keeping track and I have noticed a handful of folks who are missing a whole lot of participation and I'm gonna be reaching out to you uh, and to anybody else who is missing multiple times. We ask that your miss, that your absences, quote unquote, be limited to just one or two. When you get to three or four, we have problems because we don't get together that often. So please do make sure that you submit those digital turn-ins if you're at home. For those of you who are here, just leave them in the pews. You may depart and uh, enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Thank you for being here. We will collect them up afterwards and I'll make sure to read them and record your presence and participation. Thank you all so much. And we'll be back again uh, the first Sunday of March. First Sunday of March, right? First and third Sundays of every month, except April, since the first Sunday in April is Easter. So we'll see you. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. The first Sunday of March. Thanks. Bye. All right, Tyler. Did you get that website? Yeah, I did. I got it. Awesome. So click on, you know, open some of those uh, previous ones up and submit them for me, okay? All right. Because I do remember cool. seeing your name in the Zoom, but I need you to submit those just for the, for the records. All right. I'm almost done, but thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Tyler. See you.